Welcome to Tales She Told Me, a podcast featuring honest conversation about what it means to be a woman, a mother, and in business. I'm your host, Farah Haydar. Today, we will be discussing law of attraction, and joining me is Anne Hentz. Anne is an author, a public speaker, and a spiritual teacher. When Anne was 19, she woke up one morning to find her mother dead in her bathroom. 20 years later, the tears from that trauma were still just under the surface. Anne found a simple technique that helped her release these emotions, but she went further and can now put her awareness inside her body and has changed the bone structure of her skull and grown three quarters of an inch at age 55. Anne has found that seeking out our truth, what we truly feel, and accepting those feelings is the key to inner peace. She wants you to know that if she has done it, you can too. So welcome, Anne. It is so good to have you. I have to say that when I chose this subject, I was a little hesitant. Um, for some reason, I, I believe it and I don't. There's so much out there about the law of attraction and manifestation. And I believe in energy, but a part of me is just like, are people taking it too far? And what attracted me to you kind of was you say that you have a different way of thinking and talking about the law of attraction. So why don't we start there? Can you explain your point of view? I can, and sure. And thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I do think about the law of attraction differently, and I've developed this understanding over a period of years because I knew so many people talked about it. There had to be something to it. Mm -hmm. So what I've realized over the years is that the whole of us are a signal. We are emitting a signal every second of every day. And it's not just our thoughts. That's what you know. a lot of people talk about. It's our thoughts that are creating our future. Well, our thoughts are part of it, but also it's everything about us. So it's our shape, it's our size, it's our gender, it's our hair, it's our clothes, it's our thoughts. But the biggest part of it is the tension stored inside of us from our past from the traumas, from the memories that have emotions attached to them, from the negative beliefs, all that is stored inside of us as tension and it makes a huge difference to our signal. So that's where I came about it is this, if we're emitting a signal right now, we're attracting back into our future based on the signal that we're emitting now. Right. So even if we change our clothes, right, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of obvious when you think about it, if we change our clothes and wear something that we never normally wear and we go out into society and see our friends and people we know, they're going to comment on it. Yes. Right? So we've attracted something different because our signal has changed. So take me back here a little bit. Um, how did you come to that conclusion? Like, tell, tell, tell me the beginnings of the story. Okay, well, it was years into my story before I really understood that part about the signal. But the, the way my story started was I had a lot of trauma in childhood, um, you know, most of us do. And my family just taught me to suppress everything. I think, mm -hmm. again, a lot of us do, right? So 100%. we, had, all, yeah, we ha had these traumas, I was adopted, I was born with my foot up against my shin. Um, I experienced a house fire. I woke up to flames coming into my bedroom when I was about three or four. And I went to boys boarding school. I was the only girl boarder at a boys boarding school for a year. And I was teased mercilessly. <laughs> so yeah. that was all stored inside. There's a story there too, <laughs> how that ended up happening. But yeah, well, and both my parents became alcoholics. Right. So I was very used to walking on eggshells, never talked about anything, didn't want people to know about it. And then when I was 19, I woke up and found my mother dead on the bathroom floor and life just carried on. We didn't talk about it. Right. Yeah. I just had been taught to just hold it in and carry on with life. And that's what I did. And when I was 21, I moved from England out to the States. I became a software engineer. I got married. I had kids. And it wasn't until I was in my late 30s that I had a business altercation with a couple of other mothers at my boys' school. And these mothers were very self-confident, self-assured authority type women. And they told me, this scared mother on the inside, they told me I'd done something wrong. Yeah. 
and my mind spun out of control over and over it went you know what they'd said what i'd said what i'd done what i could have done what i didn't do just over and over for three days Oh, and wow. that's when I realized, okay, this is not normal. <laughs> Most people I knew would not react this intensely to something that really wasn't a big deal. Yeah. But that's when I realized, okay, it feels a little bit like how I would react when my dad had told me I'd done something wrong. Yeah. And that was the first time I realized, okay, maybe something from my childhood is still affecting me to this day. Okay. So where do you go from there? Like you have this realization. <laughs> <laughs> right. And where I didn't know. I didn't know where to go, but I happened to go to a doctor's appointment around that time frame. And mm -hmm. he was a holistic physician. So he had more tools. Mm -hmm. And he was also a parent at my boys' school. So he knew me from outside of the doctor's office. And he realized that I was more stressed than I should be, given that I was a stay at home mother with two young, healthy boys. Mm -hmm. And he asked me on a scale of zero through 10 what my stress level was. And I said eight. And then he asked me why. And it was that question that made me realize, oh, I was finding my mother dead on the bathroom floor when I was 19. You know, mm. keep in mind, I'm now in my late 30s. So that was two decades ago, but the tears were still just under the surface. And yeah. he happened to know this technique that is called EFT, which is short mm -hmm. for emotional freedom technique. It's also called tapping because we're tapping yeah. on certain places in our body as we're talking through something. So he tapped with me about my mother's death for about 15 minutes. And I walked away from that appointment, being able to tell the story in my mind for the first time ever without the tears there. And that's when I realized that we hold those emotions physically, we hold them stuck in our body and that we can let them go. That's amazing. You know, I, I've heard a lot about EFT. I've heard a lot about trauma storage, you know, people saying press certain areas, like you hold this kind of pain in certain areas. I don't, I'm not an expert at all, but I've been hearing about this a lot. So I, I want to dive into a little bit. So you're talking about, so now you're at EFT. That's the first step. You kind of have started this technique, but that doesn't seem like where it's ended for you, right? Right. So the EFT was the first step. What became the second step? Like what motivated you to say, okay, I, I need another process or there's something more here? Well, I had to do the EFT first. I, mm -hmm. I went, I actually started using it every day. I started tapping on when I was emotional, I would bring myself back to peace and I could, I could feel things changing, but I wanted more. Mm -hmm. So I wrote down every emotional memory I could think of from my childhood. And I tapped through them one each night for about an oh hour to an hour and a half each night. That's dedication. Because I was determined you, to change. Weren't you wiped after every session? I mean, that's, it's a lot of. Motion. To begin with, yes, yes, yeah. but it gets easier. It does okay. get easier. <laughs> right. um, but as the weeks went by, I became less reactionary. I was more peaceful on the inside and I could see the changes and it motivated me. Mm -hmm. And what I realized EFT is doing, it's, it's opening up the subconscious mind. And as it opens up the subconscious mind, our awareness expands. So you become aware more of your emotions during the day. You're just okay. aware of a deeper level of what's going on inside of you. And what I became aware of was the physical sensations underneath the emotions. So did you feel like you detached from the emotion, like you're almost seeing it as separate from you? Yeah, I could see, I could stand back and say, oh, look at me, I'm becoming mm -hmm. angry or frustrated or sad or whatever. Yes, yeah, so there's a separation there. But underneath that, right, we'll see someone in the distance and we can tell, well, maybe they're depressed or, or maybe they look a little sad, right? We can tell those things by how they're holding themselves, mm -hmm. right? By how they're holding their body. So we can become aware of that ourselves, right? So if we're holding ourselves in, in frustration, mm -hmm. where inside your body are you holding that tension? Now, when I started this process, I was not aware of that. I yeah. was just aware that I was frustrated, mm -hmm. but then I became aware, okay, I can feel frustration. It's actually tension right across my stomach, my solar plexus area. That's where I hold frustration. Now for different mm -hmm. people, it might be different, but you can become aware of it. And when I became aware of it, I realized I didn't need to tap as much. I could have tapped still using the words such, such as like, okay, I can feel this frustration in my solar plexus. Mm -hmm. But since I was aware of it, Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to feel it. I was actually in a group at the time and the guy in the group said every week, it's not about meditation. You don't have to meditate. It's all about feeling your feelings. Okay. But when I started, 
with this group, I hadn't started my tapping journey yet. So I didn't know what that meant. But as the weeks went by and I did more and more tapping, one day I thought, okay, he says it's about feeling your feelings. What does that even mean? Okay. <laughs> so I stopped myself at the kitchen sink when I was doing the dishes one day. And I said, okay, I'm going to try and do what he says. I'm going to feel my feelings. So I would catch myself thinking a thought that had some emotion attached, which could be as simple as, okay, I'm afraid of making this phone call that I've got to make. So I would feel that fear. Okay, so I have to feel my feelings. So the fear is for me, again, it's in my stomach, my solar plexus, my torso. So I'm going to put my focus on it and just feel it, hold my attention on it. But what I noticed was if I moved, or even if I took another breath, I would lose my focus on that fear. So okay. I would hold myself like a statue where I've got my focus on that fear. And I would just I'd talk to it. Okay, I can feel this tension in my solar plexus. I can feel you and I just want you to be felt because I'd suppressed it for so long, it didn't know how to be felt. So I had to train myself to feel that fear. And I would notice I'd had to take a deep breath, obviously at some point, and I would think the thought again, and I would feel the fear again, and it would have subsided a little bit. So then I would do it again. Same thought, same fear. Just hold my awareness on the fear and have to take a deep breath and it would subside. And I would do it over and over again with the same thought until there was no more fear left. And then I could make the phone call, all would be good. Yeah. Okay, so that's the second step. So now you've gone to, you've worked through some of these emotions using EFT and now you've you've feeling your feelings. So what happened then? At this point, you seem to be obviously in a very different place than when you started out. Yes, what totally. What happened after that? Well, I kept practicing it. So I would do it during the day instead of tapping. And then in the evenings, instead of tapping my childhood, I would bring collective traumas to mind, right? We all have our own individual experience of a collective trauma, like 9-11, right? We all saw different videos. We had different feelings or emotions. So I would lay on the sofa and I would bring those thoughts to mind and just feel the sensations and allow that energy to release from my body. And over time, which is, I'm talking probably months at this point. So over sure. time, it became easier and easier to do. And at some point, I realized I could keep my awareness inside my body after the tension had released. released. So it felt very different. And I knew it was something different. I didn't really know what it was. So imagine you have a stomach ache or a toothache. You can feel, right? You can sense where that pain is coming from inside your mouth or a stomach. But once the pain is released, you can't get your awareness back to that place where the pain was coming from. Mm -hmm. I realized I could do that. I could put my awareness back inside my body. And then I started to play with it because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> so I realized, okay, I can do it again, right? I could do it a second time. And then, then what, what do I do? So I started to see if I could move my awareness around inside and I could, I could go from one place inside slowly to another place. And I realized I could find tension. I could find a place with tension versus a place with no tension. So I would hold my awareness on that tension and I would do it long enough that I would feel something release. And then I would do it again and again and again. So exactly what I was doing on the outside with the feeling, the feelings, I'm now doing directly on tension inside the body. So I would start moving around my body and, and release tension everywhere. And eventually it took many, many months, but I got my awareness inside my head, uh -huh. which was huge because there was so much pain and tension inside my head. It was just incredible. And I had lived with this pain and tension for 50 years up to that point. It yeah. had been there, I believe, since I was born with my right foot up against my right shin, my whole body had been twisted, but I had no awareness of it until I was ready to be shown that tension, which is, that's when I realized, right, how much that history inside of us affects our signal, but we have no awareness of it. It's so you think that the pain that was in your skull, when you say that, just, I'm, I'm trying to understand, when you say that, are you talking about like, did you get headaches? Did you get, or was it just a tension that seemed like, it's kind of like when the air condition is humming and you get so used to it, you don't realize there's sound there until you turn it off. Absolutely. Yes. We get so okay. used to it. Now I did used to have uh, migraines 
Mm-hmm. And and I did go to an orthodontist one time and he said, you must have a lot of tension in your head. And I remember laughing at him because I said, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just <laughs> didn't have the awareness of it. So we just store things in our subconscious mind over the years, right? That programming, the, the, the traumas, the beliefs, it gets stored inside. We're just not aware of it. And this whole process reverses that whole programming so we get aware at a deeper and deeper level and each time we can release that tension and things change and that's how the bone structure of your skull change correct and and explain that what you mean like was that a positive thing for you now i'm hoping (laughs) positive um but like what does that mean Right. So once I got my awareness inside my head, there was so much pain. My left cheek was just, I could only focus on it for like a second or two at a time. It was so painful. So I had this technique that I would just focus on it. It would, it would release a little bit. I'd come and do it again. So I'd do it again and again and again. And over time that pain would release and got to the place where I could actually feel my skull bones relax as enough tension had been released and it felt really really good so yes it was absolutely a good thing but i didn't know right i i could feel things shifting inside i just didn't know how much they'd shifted until i got the x-rays and they were just orthodontic x-rays and i happened to have one from 2013 and then had new ones taken in 2021 and then i could see the changes that had happened wow. and i i was blown away myself with how much things to change because I didn't know the eye sockets could change, right? The eye sockets have aligned. My neck has always been bent. As I said, from Mm -hmm. from birth, I've had scoliosis. So my neck is straightening out and my jaw was way off to the side. I hadn't even realized I hadn't looked at that 2013 x-ray when it was taken. I didn't look at it until last year. And so it's now much more centered. So this whole system is actually aligning physically, right? And balancing on the inside and on the outside. Wow. So you feel that this all contributed to the signal you put out there, right? Which contributed to what got attracted into your life. Um, So can you dive into that a little bit? Like, do you feel that now that you fix it, how, how, how do you see that attraction changing? Right. Well, over the years, I mean, it's totally changed. I was, I was, I would have called myself highly strung. I don't know that other people would have said that because they couldn't see what was going on inside of me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I did used to have to be PTSD from from the adoption from alcoholic parents. So I was very fearful on the inside. My mind was very busy and very negative, judgmental and critical of myself and others. Right. So as I let that go, things changed on the outside. Right. So my household became more peaceful. My boys became more peaceful. Everything became more harmonious. Mm -hmm. When I started this journey, I I really, really wanted to become like some of those peaceful mothers at school. They looked, felt so peaceful and I wasn't. But as the years went by, I actually had another parent come to say and say to me that she wanted to be as peaceful as I was. (laughs) (laughs) So at that point, (laughs) right? Well, no, at that point I had changed and I did feel peaceful. So to me, it was, it was, um, it was validating. So let's talk a little bit about the signal. You, you mentioned, you know, it's down from everything, maybe things that we can't even really change, right? Like that we're, we're born in a certain sex and, and well, I guess you could always change your clothes, your hair, your stuff like, right. But your basic features, they're, they're what they are, unless you want to do surgery. Um, So tell me about how do we change our signal and can we do it in a way that's deliberate to attract things that we want into our lives. And I don't necessarily mean financial, like everyone seems to talk about law of attraction and manifestation in terms of financial stuff. I'm thinking just maybe even more peace in your household, that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. So, so absolutely you can, you can work with things, right? If there's something that you want that you don't have, then you have resistance to where you are now, right? Otherwise you wouldn't be unhappy with where you are now. You also have resistance to the thing you want because otherwise you would already have it. Okay. Right? So you'd want to bring up the thoughts that arise when you think about your current situation, right? I would write them down on the list and I would tap through each one with EFT. You also have resistance to what it is you want, right? Say it is you want a, you know, a new car. Mm-hmm. 
well, when you think about getting the new car, what are the thoughts that come up? Uh, you know, are they something like, okay, I don't have enough money mm -hmm. to do that, right? Or people will judge me or, well, I haven't paid off this other thing first. I don't deserve to have that. Whatever those thoughts or beliefs are, those are the ones that you want to catch hold of and, and tap. I would use EFT and tap through those negative beliefs mm -hmm. until they become neutral. Okay. Once they become neutral, then, then the energy can flow, right? There's nothing mm -hmm. pushing those, that thing away anymore. So mm -hmm. yeah, that is how I'd work with that. So you're looking for neutrality. You're not looking to oppose any kind of energy. It just You just want it to exist and flow. Right. Because what I've realized, right, because I can sense inside the body, I can see that the, the, the negative beliefs and the programming and everything is actually tension stored in the connective tissue. It's mm -hmm. actually physical tension stored inside. All we have to do is release it. Once you release it, then that is our true self, our natural self. That's when we can, in my words, I would say we tune into spirit more, right? There's mm -hmm. nothing holding us back. It's that, it's that ego, it's that negative belief. That's what's holding us back. And once we let go of that, then what's supposed to happen is going to happen. So you mentioned something interesting. You said that you do not meditate, right? But although for when hearing your story, I would think meditation is just kind of a natural extension for you. It almost sounds like, I know that EFT is a practice. It's an active practice, but um, it almost sounds like some of the stuff that you're seeing, especially with awareness and stuff like that, that almost sounds meditative to me. So tell me a little bit about why you don't meditate. And if you think there are benefits to meditation or not, I'd love to hear your perspective. Okay. Yes. Some people do say that what I do now could be classed as meditation, <laughs> okay. but there are so many different types of meditation, right? So mm -hmm. I'm really talking about the type where you quiet your mind. Mm. And I do believe there are benefits to that type of meditation. When you think about the signal, right? When we're, we've got a quiet mind in meditation, that's our current signal. Our current signal is peaceful. And then we're attracting peace into our future. So there are benefits to that. I just wanted my mind to be quiet all the time because mm -hmm. I knew people had been meditating for 20 years and still had a busy mind. Yeah. So with EFT, my mind quieted down within a few years. So I felt I was changing my base signal, whereas meditation, you're just kind of changing your signal in the moment. I wanted my physical signal to change. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a difference there. Now, there is a type of meditation called Vipassana meditation, where you're sensing inside the body and mm -hmm. relaxing into it. That is more along the lines of what I'm doing. I'm just okay. sensing where the tension is, holding my focused awareness on it mm -hmm. and letting it go. So it is somewhat akin to that type of meditation. It's so interesting because when I think I meditate daily. Um, so uh, when I think of meditation, though, first I've given up on quieting my mind. Maybe I shouldn't, but I, I was like, for me, it's actually not about quieting my mind. It's quieting all the external input so that I can actually hear what I maybe my, actually hear myself. That's the way I put it, which I know it's funny. Like everyone looks at me like you sound half crazy. You talk about yourself in the third person, but I, it, sometimes I feel like with all the input, we get so much that I, I feel like I, my voice gets drowned out. And for me, meditation is a way of re-engaging with that voice. And maybe with some people would call it spirit, the universe with, you know, bazillion different names. So it's nice. a very- yeah, let, let me just, can I just say something there? Absolutely. So the, the difference that it took me a while to realize is I'm no longer in my thinking mind when I'm doing this work, I'm in my sensing mind. I'm mm. feeling inside the body, but I'm not thinking. So many meditations are talking about that, what you were just talking about, using the mind, right? Think, thinking, waiting for thoughts, working with thoughts. Mm -hmm. I'm not working with thoughts. I'm not in the mind, that thinking mind. I am feeling the sensations inside the body. That's a great distinction. Because I, I, I think there's a distinct, um, what, is, what do they say? The body keeps the score, right? Um, I'm sure you've heard of that book. Yes. <laughs> um, but, uh, I haven't read it yet, although it's on my list of, of to reads, but that, that sentence just resonates with me, um, so much because I do feel like our bodies are truth tellers 
in the sense that they, even in their, with the way they react to the world around us. Um, but uh, do you see a connection between the body and the mind? Or, or are they so separate? <laughs> That's a really interesting question, right? It's yeah. hard to get your mind around it. Yeah. But, but yes, I do. And, you know, my whole journey, it feels like it's connected all of those things together. Because when I was working with EFT, you're just really working with, with words, right? With stories. I, I worked with my mother's story. Well, this happened and then that happened. And, but the tapping is working into how that's stored in the body and it's releasing the energy stored in the body around those words and those thoughts and those memories. And then deeper with the feeling, the feelings, it's released the words somewhat and it's more in the sensations and then going deeper into the body, it's holding the tension itself. And sometimes when I'm releasing tension inside the body, a memory will pop into my mind from the past and just go poof, just release. Yeah. So they're stored in the body. The, the yeah. place memories of things are stored physically in the connective tissue of the body. So it's all connected. Oh. So, okay. So now let me ask you something. You obviously have had a, a, a lot of trauma in your childhood, let's say that. Um, but you, I've looked over your bio and you say you believe everything happens for a reason. And anytime I kind of get into this discussion, I'm sure you've heard this argument a million times before. Why would, you know, X, Y, Z happen? Why would child abuse happen? Why would, or if I chose as a soul, this parent, this situation to go into, why would I choose that negative situation? So I'm curious to get your perspective on that. I'm not sure it's a choice. I mean, it may be, I may find out one day that it was yeah. a choice, <laughs> but yeah. I think those early years in life, we're not choosing that. Those early years of life are when our signal gets established. So okay. we might experience abuse in childhood and that's part of our signal. And then we will go through life replaying what, what I believe we replay from my experience is we're replaying those feelings that we experienced. So if mm -hmm. we're abused as a child, um, I can I can talk to verbal abuse, right? I experienced my side of it, right? Which is how I felt when my dad shouted at me. I also experienced him, his version of it, shouting, being the person shouting. So I experienced those two ends of that one stick. And then as I go through life, I will replay those feelings, right? I may be replay being shouted at mm -hmm. and I may replay being the shouter because I got those two signals inside of me. So we go through life replaying the same feelings over and over again until we notice them yeah. <laughs> and we feel them and we release them from our signal and then things change and we no longer experience them in our life. So that is to me, that's kind of the reason it's, there's no fault involved there's no blame involved, right? You're just getting that signal established in childhood. And then it's, then it's our job to notice everything that we feel and let it go to bring ourselves back to peace. Yeah. I, and this might sound a little harsh, but um, somebody once said to me, you know, there's an expiration date on blaming your childhood for where you're at. And I, and I'm like, that's so true. Like <laughs> at some point you're not the child anymore. You had something tragic happen to you 100%. It's not your fault. You know, you absolutely not your fault and you need to be, you need help. But then as an adult, it's your responsibility to get that help. Right. So, when we can't just suppress it. Right. I mean, some yeah. people, when they say that they're thinking, right. They're, oh, they're yeah, almost shut up blaming. And move on. No, no, right, that wasn't right, this but, person's intention. Right. Yeah. It yeah. lives inside of you. So it's, you can't, can't most of the time you can't see it right because it's stored in the subconscious mind mm -hmm. but if you realize that and for me that was that little opening realizing that my childhood was still affecting me mm -hmm. then you can go about digging it out and letting it go yeah you know I always like uh, I like to play this game with my kids which is what you heard versus what I said <laughs> do you know what I mean it's because it's different and I think some of that is the signal playing in like Someone might walk in and slam the door. I'll hear he's angry. 
someone else might hear he's in a rush. And I think that's kind of based on our signal, right? It's Absolutely. Based on our past, based on our programming. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I think I'm getting it. I've always proud, prided myself on being a good student, part of my signal. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, so you say that you think this, this work can change the world, right? So talk to me a little bit about that. How? By doing this work, by in realizing that it's a signal, right? That we're emitting a signal every second of every day. Once I really got that, right? That helped me so much because it allowed me to catch myself. Okay, what's my signal right now? Mm -hmm. right? I would ask myself that during the day. And if I'm listening to news or something and some political thing maybe is riling me up, mm -hmm. if I can notice that and do something about it right then, right? If I can tap and bring myself back to peace, my signal has changed, right? Five minutes ago, if I was riled up, that's my signal is a riled up signal. And I'm going to attract that back into my future. I'm going to attract events into the future that is going to rile me up the same way. Mm -hmm. However, if I bring myself back to peace, my signal is now at peace and I'm emitting the signal of peace and I'm going to attract peace back into my future. Mm. So if enough of us do that, right? Yeah. Get, stop being riled up, bring ourselves back to peace. We've changed our future. It's the cumulative effect, right? Of everyone. Yes. So, yeah, because I was going to just about to follow up that with, okay, that's on a, you know, on an individual level, but what about the collective, right? Um, and that's something I hear this younger generation talk about a lot, the collective. They seem to be, you know, you hear the term breaking generational curses and stuff like that. The way they talk about it, it's almost as if, you know, they kind of get this concept of we, we were born with a certain energy or signal. Now, they, they kind of take it as almost if it's been passed down. I think it's been passed down by behaviors. Not so sure it's passed down, but there is science that say genetically we pass down trauma to our yeah. kids. Well, I believe it, it's kind of vibrationally, right? It would come yeah. through a sperm and egg vibrationally into the next generation. It's, um, yeah, that's, uh, I find that so fascinating. I can't wait till they have actually more like research about it. I mean, so, sometimes you can instinctively know something, but it's nice to have the backup. Um, okay. Well, thank you. I wanted to thank you for your time first, but before I let you go, I have this one question that I speak, talk to everyone about, and it is, what is a weird habit or ritual you have that makes your life more joyful. <laughs> okay. I mean, the one I was going to say is, I mean, I do my inner work all the time because it feels so good, okay. but I do love singing in the shower. I must admit <laughs> one <laughs> of the things the that's vibration. changed. One of the things that's changed over the years is I believe our head, our skull is our echo chamber for our voice. And I, I used to have an awful voice, right? I couldn't even get to some notes, like middle notes. There were some I couldn't reach. And as I've released the tension in my skull and my head, my voice has changed. So I enjoy singing. <laughs> it's getting better all the time. So it's really nice. Wow, that is amazing. I might have to do that because when I sing in the shower, my kids beg me to stop. They're like, please stop. I'm like, I'm in the shower alone. Why are you in my bathroom? Go away. Anyways, <laughs> and it was an absolute pleasure having you. And listeners, if you're out there and you'd like to hear more from Anne, you can subscribe to her YouTube channel named Anne Hentz or get her book, A Pathway to Insight, Recapture Your Childhood Buzz. All links in the show notes below. As always, I'd love to hear from you about this episode. Do you believe in the law of attraction? Why or why not? Hit me up on Instagram or Facebook at Farah Haydar. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you'll get notified when a next episode is available. Also. I'm giving away a PDF of some of the best quotes we've had on the show. Beautifully designed to print and journal your thoughts. Email me at farah at farahadar.com and title it quotes. Talk to you soon. Till then, chase your happy. <laughs>